My name is Michla Pomerantz. I'm speaking on the UN and Israel's virtual right of self-defense. Uh, many years ago, when my daughter was either in first or second grade, the school was contemplating introducing school uniforms. And in the spirit, and in the spirit of democracy, the matter was debated uh, in all the classes. My daughter came home and reported that her teacher favors having school uniforms. Uh, how do you know? I asked. Is that what she said? No, she replied, not exactly. But every time a child presented an argument for, the teacher said yes. Uh, and when there was an argument against, she said yes, but. Uh, I, I was reminded of this when thinking about the UN's approach to Israel's right of self-defense. UN members and organs sometimes affirm and understand Israel's right to defend itself, and sometimes they even manage grudgingly to deplore suicide bombing and the indiscriminate firing of rockets at Israeli <clears throat> These affirmations are invariably accompanied by significant buts that negate the affirmations and transform Israel's right of self-defense into mere illusion. The reservations are real. Uh, the affirmations are only chimerical, virtual. All agree there is a right of self-defense against aggression. Aggression is a nasty thing. To initiate a war of aggression, the Nuremberg tri Tribunal recognized long ago, is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. As long as the UN fails to protect its members from aggression, they may continue to defend themselves. But for the UN, aggression is not what you may think it is. The use of force for self-determination is not aggression at all. It's defense. And those who would oppose self-determination are the real aggressors. <coughs> this is not international law. It's not UN Charter law. It is UN law. In it, the principle of self-determination has been transformed into a right, a super norm, placed at the pinnacle of international norms, and supplanting the central tenet of the Charter, the prohibition of the use of force. But then who separates the geese from the gander? Virtuous selves, and who are their oppressors? In the new UN law, the modern revival of the just war doctrine and its evils, the General Assembly and other organs have replaced the medieval church. Palestinians have been given pride of place among these favored selves. They are deemed entitled to have a state regardless of its threatening nature, but the Jewish right of, to self-determination got lost somehow on the way to the forum. There's no recognition of what FDR came to acknowledge when he said, the choice freely exercised by a nation must not threaten the world with the disaster of war, and the right of self-determination does not carry with it the right of any government anywhere in the world to commit wholesale murder. In this UN universe, the favored selves have only rights, the disfavored have only obligations. Thus, the International Court of Justice, as we heard, in its opinion on Israel's security fence, and we'll, we'll hear more about it later, uh, accorded Palestine the privileges of a state, but exempted it from obligation. And this was criticized by Justice uh, Judge Rosalind Higgins, who nevertheless didn't dissent. She wrote a separate opinion for some reason. Uh, in any case, for the court majority, the Palestinian right of self-determination was severely fenced in uh, on the basis of legally unfounded and morally unconscionable interpretation of Article 51 of the UN Charter 
uh, and of the post 9-11 Security Council anti-terrorist resolutions, the court denied Israel the possibility of benefiting from any of these texts. Missing from the court's calculus and from the UN generally is the context of Israel's ongoing battle with terrorism and the deliberate targeting of its civilian population. These are simply ignored while the focus is shifted to Palestinian or Lebanese suffering. But even when uh, Israel's plight is grudgingly noted as part of the so-called cycle of violence, better described as it all started when he hit me back, mold, what, according to the UN, may Israel do? Basically, nothing. It must act with both hands tied behind its back. Otherwise, its actions will automatically be condemned as disproportionate. We heard about that this morning. Uh, Israel must measure proportionality not in relation uh, to the overall threat, but only in relation to the immediately preceding attack. It may not attempt to remove the danger, only at most to repel it, and even then, not really. And we heard what the equivalent might have been had the United States been permitted after Pearl Harbor to just attack some of uh, the Japanese boats. Uh, in any case, clearly, the ludicrous standard of proportionality applied to Israel is not one that any state would accept today in its own battles against aggressors and terrorists. In a war that was legitimate, that they deemed legitimate, they would expect to win by applying disproportionate force, inflicting greater damage on the enemy than the enemy can inflict on them, and thereby forcing the enemy to end the aggression. But as Robert W. Tucker observed back in 1982, Israel is held to a very, quote, to a very rigid standard, one that no government would seriously consider holding to in practice. Now, international law, which we heard also denigrated, but some of us make our money through that, so therefore it exists. Uh, international law is based on state consent and state practice. The repetition of condemnatory non-binding resolutions does not create law. Uh, as Prosper Weil from France has noted, the accumulation of non-law is no more sufficient to create law than is thrice nothing to make something. Or, as an Italian jurist, Arangio Ruiz, put it, General Assembly resolutions aren't lawmaking regardless of the times that they are shouted and the size of the choir. But Israel is subjected to UN law, a law that is preached to others and increasingly preached to Israel alone. It is called upon to obey, quote, soft law, legitimated by a fictitious legal entity labeled the OIC, the OIC, the Organized International Community. On matters bearing on aggression and self-defense, the preaching choir of the OIC initially consisted mainly of a Soviet Third World Coalition of the General Assembly, in the General Assembly, and its controversial postulates were for a while resisted by the West. But by the 1990s, Western European states had joined the jackals, the automatic majority, and there's no real sign of their reverting anytime soon to their earlier saner and fairer approach, despite understandable wishful thinking among many Israeli academics and practitioners. The laws of war, and the realities of peacemaking are based on reciprocity. But in UN law and practice vis-a-vis -vis Israel, reciprocity is what is most lacking. As no noted by Innes Claude, the author of Swords into Plowshare, the foremost uh, scholar of the UN, the UN majority accepts the Palestinian concept of unilateral war, the notion that they are in a state of war against Israel and are therefore entitled to attack, but that Israel is not in a state of war against them and is therefore not entitled to counterattack. 